Congregational Church, a church of the United Church of Christ, a place where we still believe faith matters. We welcome you to this faithful worshiping community where we believe in a still speaking God. So, take a breath, it's been quite a week, and let us begin worship.
think he required that was exquisitely beautiful. Thank you. So the prodigal son is one of the world's most famous stories. And what I like about stories like this is that they speak vividly to God's intent to always welcome the lost. But, you know, just like Maureen did, it's always a good idea to try to situate yourself inside these biblical stories. To say, who am I in this story? in this ancient parable. I think that we really relate to the older brother. I mean, can you imagine <laughs> the audacity of his younger brother? <laughs> I mean, I think this parable is troubling and unsettling for those of us who count themselves as part of being upright and moral and law-abiding. And you know what's really disturbing about this? Is we know how we feel about those prodigal folks in our lives. Because every neighborhood, every school, and yes, every family has produced a prodigal of some kind. The fellow who just got out of jail last week and now has moved back in with his mother. Or the things that make you kind of roll your eyes. The young woman who saddles her mother with the second accidental child. And those internal family secrets. The daughter in rehab. The son who can't keep a job. They might not have squandered their inheritance, but they've squandered their youth and the chances they had to make something of themselves. That's what we're dealing with here. It's them, the wasteful ones, the inconsiderate ones. It's them, the ones who never think things through and then get belligerent about it. Yeah, this story is about them and us. Us, the faithful ones, the long-suffering ones, the rule keepers. I mean, if you are faithful ones keeping the rules, this is about justice and fairness. I've been doing the right thing. And what makes this problem, child, worthy of all this love and welcome? I understand the elder brother in this story. I'm the eldest person in my family. And I was told over and over and over and over to be responsible, to be respectful, to do the right thing. Because if I did not, I am not just living below my potential, but I'm letting my whole family down. I am misrepresenting them and the world with my nonsense. So I get the older brother's attitude. Because when the prodigal demands his inheritance, it's like he's asking his father to, I wish you were dead already so I can get what's mine. <coughs> and for what? Just leave him to have a good time, to do what he wants, with who he wants, any way he wants, any time he wants. And he wants to live large while he's doing it. Jesus tells us that the prodigal son took his inheritance and squandered it, all of it, but on things that he needed companions. Because guess what? You can't party by yourself. You can't gamble by yourself. You can't even have illicit relationships by yourself. You need companions for that. And so the son leaves seeking good times and other companions. And we can hear the excess and the addiction chasing him through all this. But it also makes me wonder what home was like. I mean, what was he so hungry for? What what hole was he seeking to fill? 
Because I also know if we're honest, we also know what it's like to yearn for more than what we are experiencing right now. But we also know that yearning, that hunger can't be filled with artificial substances or <coughs> intoxicants. Even empty mechanical sex devoid of love. Not even just consuming and buying things. I mean, the younger brother, did he need to be noticed? Did he need to be understood that his gifts were so different than his brother? Did he need to just know what it's like for once to be one of the popular ones? Or had the way he had been parented been heavy on the rod and light on the loving? But whatever his inner motivation was, his remedy was the sweet dream of financial independence and distance from the relationships he'd always known. Get the money and live, live, live. That was his sweet dream. So last night when I was going over this sermon, this song came on the radio and I was like, that's the prodigal son song. It was by the Eurythmics, I'm dating myself, sweet dreams are made of this. Who am I to disagree? I've traveled the world in the seven seas. Everybody's looking for something. Some of them want to be me. Some of them want to get used by you. Some of them want to abuse you. And some of them want to be abused. The reality of his sweet dream of financial independence and good times turns into a nightmare. Because he was abused and used. So then the Bible says, so he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. And Jewish law said to eat swine was to become as a Gentile and to live outside of the covenant. So not only has he disrespected his father, not only has he squandered his inheritance, now he is living outside of the dictates of his faith community. Now at this point when Jesus is telling this story, the Jewish hearers are ready for the story to end. They're ready for this son to get what he deserves. He has been reduced to the horrendous level of feeding the most unclean of animals and then eating what they eat. At this point, in the Jewish community hearing this, the son is cut off from their community and any financial charity that they would have otherwise given him, destroyed. But I understand the Jewish hearers that identify also with the elder brother. I mean, this guy is just a mess up. How is he going to be treated better than me? I mean, if I'm the older brother, does my life and my duty and my sacrifice stay here day after day, year after year, count for nothing? And I think this is the real twist in the text. Because we have to be very, very careful. For that type of thinking takes us to a place of who is deserving and not deserving of grace. That type of thinking takes us to a place thinking we determine who does and who does not deserve second chances. You know, it's that thing that rises up in you when someone cuts in front of you in the grocery line <laughs> or in the store or worst of all when they steal your parking spot. <laughs> I mean those people who take us to a place 
of immediate anger. You, you! <laughs> but we're not the prodigal. We are here patiently waiting. We're not parking spot thieves. <laughs> we aren't reckless. We know the pitfalls of immediate gratification. But you know what? When we look deeper at our being really peed off and our silently calling those people anything but a child of God, our moment of rage of how dare they of being ignored or passed over really says more about us than about the person who has upset us. We have to be very careful about that. When we complain about those who have appeared to cut in line or taken the easy road, we have to be careful that we don't echo the sentiments of the Pharisees and the scribes. You know, they were distinguished by strict observance to the law. And those people in their strict observance of the law stood with the oppressors when Jesus was standing with the oppressed. Jesus tells these parables in response to the righteous rejection of Jesus reaching out to the dark downtrodden. Well, wait a minute, we're not like those hypocrites that Jesus is rebuking. We love God. And we see ourselves as recipients of God's ridiculous grace. I mean, we're good, responsible people. But you know what? It's a slippery slope, this feeling righteous. I mean, when we harshly criticize the undocumented for cheating the system and the poor from relying on government without hearing their stories and empathizing with their plights, we join the naysaying of those who are supposed to be righteous, refusing to love our neighbors as we would want to be loved, forgetting from whence we came we forget that parts of our past were full of struggle and hardship as well. The Bible says, don't forget you were once slaves in Egypt. And when we see the gaping inequality between us and credit the wealthy for their success, but judge the poor for their laziness, we fall into these destructive but ancient patterns. You know, like Job's friend who thought his plight was due to his just being cursed and sinful. I mean, when we see people who are convicted of crimes, probably not going to see the light of day, and then we hear about them studying theology, do we see this as ridiculous? as a waste of time and resources. I mean, most of these people will never live outside of a jail cell again. Or might we see the promise of a new life embodied in these prisoners wherever they are? You have to be careful about being so righteous, about patting yourself on the back for being a good rule follower and for being so judgmental of those who lose their way. But the surprise in this parable is the father's reaction. For really, the father is the main character of this parable, not the son. This is not the story of the lost son, but of a father who never ceases to love his ungrateful son, his addicted child, his unemployed child. 
the child who has experienced such horrible things, he can never really become clean again. So the Bible says, the son set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was so filled with compassion, he ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Now it was a breach of an elderly Jewish man's dignity to run. Given the normal garb, his father would have had to pull up his robes to run. The neighbors probably would be laughing and taunting and attempting to humiliate the young man when they saw him coming home. But to spare him that, the father humiliates himself and hikes up his robe and just starts running towards him. You know, rules are funny things. They're supposed to keep you safe and promote your goodness. And most of the time they do, but at other times, they can destroy your happiness and entrap you. So part of this lesson is we all have to find a way to work within the rules. And we have to find our time to break the rules. Here's what the father of the prodigal son seems to know, that love and happiness are worth breaking the rules to find. He knows that one brother cannot replace another, nor can the love between them be required simply because they're part of the same family. Now we realize it's not really about them and us. It's not about who breaks the law and who stands by the law. It's realizing that we have all run into the world seeking what we most yearn for. All of us. And at times, all of us have disrespected the core of our connection in that empty pursuit. And by God's grace and compassion, we are welcomed back, back home. There is profound joy when the younger son finds his way home, but the father's joy is still not complete because his other son now, spiritually, emotionally, is not at home. Home to the place where they are one and all that matters is love. Indeed, the saddest part of the story that Jesus shares with us today is not that the younger brother had strength, but that the older brother is allowing himself to remain bound up in his own bitter self-righteousness, his own resentment. So the question is put to us this morning, what shall it be? Shall we, shall I, set aside my own bitter pride and go and celebrate the homecoming of the lost, irresponsible one? I mean, can I, can I really go inside and party and celebrate the we of our connection? Or shall I continue to deny the power, the grace, and the love of God for the ones I have deemed to be somehow fundamentally different from me, thinking I am proving a point, which was never God's point at all. 
Can't you hear this the echo of Jesus' voice saying, whatever you have done to the least of us, you've also done to me. Amen. I keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single voice that tells me I will never measure up. Am I more than just the sum of every high and every low? Remind me once again just who I am because I need to know. Go in peace. See you in a minute. And amen. 